Okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Before we start our event for today, please rename your profile into room underscore name underscore institution. Room one is for law, education, language, and political science. Uh, room two for economics, business, finance, and others. And room three for applied science. Okay, I repeat, please change your name into room underscore name underscore institution. So the operator can, can invite you to the breakout room. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. okay, we are going to start the event today. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alhamdulillahirrabbilalamin wa salatu wassalamu ala nabiyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Good morning ladies and gentlemen and distinguished guests. The Honorable Counselor of Juanda University, Dr. Haji Martin Rustami SHMH, Associate Professor, Chief of Foundation of Yayasan Pusat Studi Pengembangan Islam Amaliyah Indonesia, Rector of Juanda University, Associate Professor Dr. Insinyur Dede Kardaya MSI, And of course, our keynote speakers for today, Professor Dr. Nurul Hilal Muhammad Dahlan from University Utara Malaysia, Dr. Bambang Wijayanto, Juanda University Indonesia, Professor Madia Dr. Abdurrahman Raden Aji Haki from University Islam Sultan Sharif Ali Brunei Darussalam, Professor Insinyur Muhammad Ali Fulazaki, CES BEA from Juanda University Indonesia, And Dr. Bun Lang Se, Royal University of Phnom Penh, Cambodia. Prof. T.S. Dr. Suhaidi Hasan, PhD, PTH, SMIEE -E, from University Utara, Malaysia. And of course, all invited guests and all participants. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 5th Bogor International Conference for Applied Science 2021. entitled Embracing the Global Society to Face New Normal Era Through Applied Science, and the fifth Bogor International Conference for Social Science 2021, entitled Support the Post-Pandemic Restoration Through Social Research for the Global Tenacity. Okay, virtual applause, please. And this event is organized by Juanda University and also our co-host uh, for this event, Universitas Ibnu Khaldun, Bogor, UIK. Thank you for UIK. Okay, uh, let's jump to the first agenda. Let's hear the recitation of the Holy Quran by Rizal Samsu Ma'arif SHMH. Mr. Rizal, green is yours. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا تفسحوا في المجالس فافسحوا يفسح الله لكم وإذا قيل انشزوا فانشزوا يرفع الله الذين آمنوا منكم والذين أوتوا 
ilma darajati Wallahu bima ta'maluna khabir Ya فَإِلَّمْ تَجِدُوا فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ غَفُورٌ رَحِيمٌ Alamin. Thank you for the recitation, Mr. Yuliza Jazakallah Khair. And now, ladies and gentlemen, let's hear the national anthem, Indonesia Raya and Juanda University hymn. Operator, please proceed.
Okay, thank you for operator. Next, next we will hear conference report by the chair conference, Professor Muhammad Ali Fulazaki. Professor, are you here with us? Yeah. Okay, please, Professor. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. First of all, let us praise to Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because of his blessing, we are able to attend this conference today. Who give us a million of favor, and we could attend this event with festivity and strong sense of community spirit. Being thankful and saying our gratitude. Salawat and salam open our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam as the perfect oral model of human who give us a flawless leaf rule model and we do keep trying to follow him. Honorable Counselor of Universitas Juanda, Honorable Boards of Directors of Yayasan Pusat Studi Pengembangan Islam Amalia Indonesia, Honorable Rector of Universitas Juanda, Honorable University Co-host Universitas Ibnu Khaldun, Honorable Kena Speaker, Professor Noral Hilal Madahlan from University Utara Malaysia, Dr. Bambang Ijojanto from University Juanda, Associate Professor Abdurrahman Raden Aji Haki from Sultan Sharif Ali Islamic University, Brunei Darussalam, Mr. Bun Leng Si from Royal University of Phnom Penh, Professor Suhaidi Hassan from University Utara Malaysia, and all participants of the Fifth Bogor International Conference for Applied Science and the Fifth Bogor International Conference for Social Science 2021. I would like to thank you all for joining us today to attend the international webinar of reputable annual event of the fifth Bogor International Conference for Apalchen and fifth Bogor International Conference for Social Science 2021. It is a great honor for me to welcome all of you to this conference which has been held and only signed 2017. Even the event of conference for this year is still to be held during the COVID pandemic. We believe that current situation will not stop researchers to do what they want to do. This is the reason of why we have decided to organize this conference for this year, like the last year virtually. We really appreciate and very grateful for full support of our conference partner, Universitas Ibn Khaldun, signed 2017. So I will invite all of you to follow Sikh Kena speech during this conference. After that, it will be the time for all scholars to present their follower, their follower research in the parallel session. Ladies and gentlemen, we are actively playing a part in conference because of our mutual passion for nature, for natural and social science spur ongoing research support, publication, professional development, 
and networking for better world. As the vision of Universal Juanda continuously commits to be one of the world class research university in the future, we need to work hard to complete the current task of being trusted by Nancy scholar and expert from Brunei Darussalam, Cambodia, France, Germany, Iran, Malaysia, Pakistan, Singapore, Thailand, UK, USA, Vietnam, and Indonesia during this conference. The theme of this conference are, one, embracing the global society to face the new normal era through applied science, and two, supporting the post-pandemic resurrection through social research for global tenacity. We believe that it is one of the way in achieving our mission of scientific publication. Universitas Juanda as one of the educational institution have commitment persistent to improve its service to the public through fifth pillar or pancha dharma of teaching and learning research community service tohit and professionalism ladies and gentlemen all participants of the conference i believe that i have gone to speak long enough everyone we come off to all of you and please enjoy uh, this event and i wish you to get a great experience during this conference thank you wallahu yaqulun hat wa yahdi sabil assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you for the report, Professor. We hope the conference went smooth and fully blessed. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, and now we will hear opening remarks by Rector of Jona University, Associate Professor Dr. Dede Kardaya. Dr. Dede, are you here with us? Yes. Okay, how are you today? I'm fine, thank you. <laughs> okay, Dr. Dede, the time is yours. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And as I praise to the person of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who gives thousands of paper to us until this day. So we could attend this event with good cheer, full of the strong sense of community and set our gratitude. Salawat as well as greeting to our prophet, prophet Muhammad Wasallam, who give us a life role model well and we should emulate as followers. The Honorable Chancellor Ubas Juanda, Executive Director and Board of Director of Yayasan Pusat Tudi Pengembangan Islam Amalia Indonesia, Rector of Universitas Ibn Khaldun as our co-host and distinguished guest. Yes, before we get started, I would like to thank you all for coming and joining us here today in the fifth Bogor International Conference for Social Science 2021 and the fifth Bogor International for Applied Science 2021. We are pleased to be having all of you and highly appreciate for spending all your supportive effort in succeed the event, especially to our remarkable keynote speakers in our conference. Dr. Haji Bambang Wijoyanto, SHMSG, Law Expert Lecturer for Graduate School Universitas Juanda, Indonesia, Professor Dr. Nuarwal Hilal Muhammad Dahlan, Professor of Law, School of Law, University Utara Malaysia, Professor Madia, Dr. Abdurrahman Raden Aji Haki, Professor of Syariah Law University Islam Sultan Sarif Ali, Professor Muhammad Ali Puajaki, CESDA, Head of Writing Center Universitas Juanda, Indonesia, Professor Dr. Swaidi Hasan in 
Internet Works Research Laboratory University Utara Malaysia and Dr. Buning Se, Department of Geography and Land Management Royal University of Phnom Penh. Please give your round of applause for them. Thank you. They will share their research excellence as they have been contributed to the research and education in the world. Also, thank you to all participants for your spirit to brighten the future of education and world sustainability through research. Ladies and gentlemen, you have all chosen to be a part of our association because of our mutual passion for research and publication. We believe that this conference could be the way to accelerate publication and research originality to express our responsibility as a lecturer or a researcher. Distinguished guests, we should be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because in this COVID-19 pandemic situation, we can still collaborate and contribute to the progress of society. Therefore, through this virtual conference, let us expand our collaboration, not only between fellow researchers and scientists, but more broadly embracing all levels of society, including government, businessmen, economic and industrial activists. With collaboration like this, we will become stronger in building civilization in a globalized world. We, as lecturer or researcher, must continue to carry out education, research, and community tasks in any situation, including in the atmosphere of the COVID-19 pandemic, which began to hit around mid-March 2020. Therefore, in carrying out this task, we must make some adjustment or adaptation. Research and community service policy at Juana University refer to two basic principles. Firstly, adjusting to, to the supplementary guidelines for research and community service during the COVID-19 pandemic published by our government. And secondly, following research and community service protocol during the COVID-19 pandemic. Because of the push policy, some research time are continued to be carried out in 2020, some were postponed in 2021, and some were adjusted to research time for the prevention or treatment of the COVID-19. Furthermore, because of the second policy, in following the protocol of research and community service, we always prioritize human safety, mainly the dignity of scientific integrity and standard of academic credibility and adjust toward more functional changes. We have adjusted our research method and strategies while maintaining the quality of the data collected. We also have supported our resources preparing the need for various software application and digital technology that can improve digital based research process, both in the social humanities and the applied science discipline. To maintain the number of research due to the declining number and types of research grant provided by the Minister of Education, Culture, Research and Technology because of the COVID 19 pandemic, we are increasing the number of internal research grants, especially for our young researchers. In addition, we are also looking for other sources of research grants, both from within the country and from abroad through collaborative research. Ladies and gentlemen, we believe that by participating in this conference, we are in the right place and the right time. Let us accelerate the exchange of ideas and scaling up good practices. We are confident that we will find new ideas, fresh energy, and novel partnership to sustain our effort to face the new era through applied science and to support post-pandemic resurrection through social science for global tenacity. On this remarkable occasion, allow us to express our congratulations and 
highest appreciation to our reputable scholar, Professor Muhammad Aipula Jaki, CSDA, who achieved the recognition as the top 2% world's ranking scientist issued by Elsevier, VP, and Stanford University in October 20, 2021. Ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to all of you, and please enjoy this event, and I wish you a great experience in our conference. By saying, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, hereby I officially open the conference. Thank you. Wallahu yakulha kuwaho yahdisabil. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you for the opening remarks. Collaboration to get stronger. Okay, wow, well, that's very good, yeah. Dr. Dede Kardaya, hope you always be in good health, productive as usual, and cheerful always. Amin, ya Rabbal Alamin. Okay, before we get into the main agenda, I would like to invite all audience to recite some prayer for the goodness of the event, led by Dr. Kandidat Radif Hotamirusli, MED. Mr. Radif, are you there? Mr. Radif, are you ready? Perhaps it's still mute. Operator? Mr. Radif, please on screen. Is there Mr. Radif in here? I don't know. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Okay, please continue to uh, read the prayers. Okay, can you unmute yourself, Mr. Hotami? No, you cannot. Okay, we will wait for the operator for a while. Okay. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah, salatu wassalamu ala rasulillah. Wa ala alihi muhammadin. Wa sahbihi wa man tabi'ahu bil huda yawm ila yawm al qiyamah. In the name of Allah. The beneficent, the merciful, praise be to Allah, Lord of the world. Let your blessing and your peace be on your servant and your messenger, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and his family and his companions. Allah, may Allah, on this glorious day, in conjunction with the opening ceremony of our gathering, Bogor International Conference, 5th BICAS and 5th BICSS 2021, we uphold our hand to pray gratefully to thank on your infinite favor to us till we can live in peace and harmony to perform our task as your servants. Oh Allah, we ask your blessing to make this occasion in success. Allahumma ya hayu ya qayyum ya Allah jalali wal ikram. You are the mercy of the mercies and you are the Lord of the universe. Give us mercy from your presence and share for us right conduct in our plight. We ask you for knowledge, which beneficial and sustenance, which is good and deed, which, is are, accept, which are acceptable. Allah, help us to, rem to remember you, to thank you, and to worship you in the best of manners. Forgive us, have mercy, mercy upon us, guide us, give us help, and grant us our, our sustenance. Mm -hmm. Rabbi Firlana Wali Wali Daina Warham Huma Kamar Bayana Sigora Wali Huanin and Ladina Sabakuna Bid Iman, Wala Tajal Fi Kulubina Gilla Lil Ladina Amanu, Rabbana in the Karo for Rahim, Rabbana Atina Fidunia Hassana, Wafila Hrati Hassana Tawakina Ada Banar, Subhana Rabbi Karabil Azati and Maya Sifun, was Salamun Al Musalin, or Hamdrila Rabbil Alamin. Alhamdulillah Hirabil Alamin, Amin Yorabal Alamin, thank you, Mr. Adi, for the prayer. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, 
now we will jump right into the main agenda. Keynote speaker session for the fifth BICSS 2021. And I will be your moderator for the season. So I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Artius DRT. I'm lecturer from Faculty of Agriculture, Juanda University. And before, of course, I'd like to greet and introduce our keynote speakers here. So operator, please be ready to put uh, the speakers on screen. Okay, the first speaker for BICAS, Professor Dr. Nurul Hilal Muhammad Dahlan. Professor Nurul Hilal, how are you? Assalamualaikum. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. How Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Okay, Professor Nurul Halal here is Professor of Law from School of Law, University Utara, Malaysia. Prof, you will be the first speaker, so please be ready. Okay, and then uh, next, uh, Dr. Bambang Wijoyanto. Dr. Bambang? Dr. Bambang, how are you? Hi, how are you today? Alhamdulillah, fine. Alhamdulillah, and... I'm fine. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, Alhamdulillah. And Dr. Bambang Wijoyanto is a law expert from Juanda University, Indonesia. He's a well-known law expert, actually. Yeah? And you will be the second speaker, Dr. Bambang, for today. Yes, I do. Thank you very much for your information. Thank you. Okay, and then Professor Madia, Dr. Abdurrahman Raden Ajihaki. Okay, how are you, Prof? Alhamdulillah, fine. And how are you, Bu? Alhamdulillah, fine. <laughs> Are you fine? Okay. okay. Yeah, and Dr. Uh, Abdurrahman Rajan Aji Hakis from Fakultas Syariah dan Undang-Undang University Islam Sultan Syarif Ali Brunei Darussalam. And all the speakers will deliver the presentation about 15 minutes. And we also have Q&A question uh, session. So all the participants may ask your question in the chat box with a format name and institution and the speaker address too. Okay, and then the question. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, we will hear from our first speaker for today, Professor Dr. Nurul Hila Muhammad Dahlan from University Utara Malaysia, with him housing development legal aspect during COVID-19 pandemic in Malaysia. Professor? Thank you. Professor? Okay, screen is yours. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Honorable uh, Chancellor uh, Universitas Juanda, Associate Professor Dr. H. Martin Rustami, Honorable Professor Muhammad Ali Fulazaki, the Chair Conference of FIFA uh, BICS and FIS BICSS 2021. Uh, Mrs. Madam Arti Yusdiani, Yusdiarnti, eh? uh, the MC today. Thank Ladies you, and gentlemen, sir. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh. Alhamdulillah rabbil alamin. Wassalatu wassalamu ala ashraqil anbiya wal mursalin wa ala ahli wa sahbi ajma'in. Firstly, I would like to thank... Uh, Conference organizer, Nustas uh, Juanda, and particularly the Chancellor, Dr. Martin Rostami, for having invited me to this uh, distinguished and historical, historic conference annually uh, conducted by Nustas Juanda. Thank you very much. I would like, uh, before I proceed with my presentation today, uh, with the recitation of Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, I want to share my PowerPoint presentation. My to topic this morning, entitled Housing Development Legal Aspects During COVID-19 Pandemic in Malaysia. Today, COVID-19 is still widely spreading, even in Malaysia, even though vaccination has taken place, majority of the citizens 
got vaccination but the spread of this pandemic is still unprecedented is still uncertain whether we can succeed to deal and meet this challenge heavy challenge covid-19 pandemic really hit the whole the whole world in malaysia many economic sectors and industry social activities economic activities educational activities and development activities program and programs in malaysia have been substantially affected at least 60 to 70% it affect the whole country this also involve housing industry in malaysia covid-19 affect the supply the supply chain movement it affects the construction activities for example workers cannot carry out the construction project architect engineers cannot go to work banks sometimes have closed because of the spreading covid-19 among the employees so these are among the problems that affect housing development machinery and industry in malaysia malaysia Housing industry in Malaysia is a booming industry since 1960s. It provides housing accommodation to the nation. It also energizes the economic sector. It provides the in terms of employment, in terms of supply chain, in terms of banking and monetary development. because of lending borrowing and lending activities so to control housing industry since 1966 1966 malaysia introduced several statutes to govern the activities of housing development and housing industry in malaysia particularly to protect the interests and rights of the purchaser against irresponsible developer so that the purchaser will get houses fit for human habitation after they pay after they pay all the payment required at the purchase price as stated in the sale and purchase agreement as well as the developer can get profit uh, from their economic activities in the housing industry So the purpose of this statute Housing Development Control and Licensing Act 1966 is to balance between the interest and rights of the housing developer company housing developer companies and the purchaser public so that both party can achieve equitable benefits from the industry These are housing legislation hitherto are enforced in Malaysia. Firstly, Housing Development Control Act, Control and Licensing Act 1966, Act 118, Housing Development Tribunal for Home Buyer Claims Regulation 2000, uh, 2002. This is about the law how home uh, home buyer tribunal. can protect the interest of the purchaser against irresponsible developer and provide remedies to the aggrieved parties subject to the jurisdiction and power provided provided in this regulation housing development compounding of offenses regulation 2002 this is to compound offenses against the defaulting developers 
housing developers, housing development account regulation 1991. This is for the purpose of managing and controlling the money uh, received from the bank to ensure that all the money channeled by the bank must be used by the developer in accordance with the law and to protect the interest of the purchases so that the money will not be swindled and fraudulent, cause any uh, fraudulent activities to the detriment or to the chagrin of the purchases public. And finally, Housing Developers Control and Licensing Regulation 1989. Under this regulation contain specific uh, statutory formatted sale and purchase agreement. The developer must follow the national standard sale and purchase agreement which the government set and they do not have liberty and freedom to choose whatever terms they wish to choose and provide in the agreement that will cause dangerous situation, that will cause uh, a grief, grievance to the purchaser. So the government takes the responsibility to provide specific agreement, sale and purchase agreement in order to ensure equity, justice, between developer and the purchaser. So the purpose of this Housing Development Control Licensing Act 1966 contain in the long title, in the early part, in the earlier part of the statute, uh, an act to provide for the control and licensing of the business of housing development in Peninsula Malaysia the protection of the interest of purchasers and for matters connected therewith. So the intention, the aim of this statute is to protect the interest of the purchasers. So all the provision and the terms contained in, the, in this uh, Act, Housing Development Act, aims to provide protection and to ensure that the purchaser public will not be defrauded and cause uh, any injustices to them by the developer and other uh, parties. Nevertheless, this Housing Development Act is only applicable in the state of Peninsula Malaysia. The East Malaysia, Sabah and Sarawak uh, do not apply this law. They have separate law because we in Malaysia, we have agreement with Sabah and Sarawak whereby Sabah and Sarawak have the right to accept or not to accept uh, the federal legislation and federal policy as prescribed under the federal constitution in Malaysia. So among the important section is section 5, provision against housing development except by virtue of a license and provision relating to grant of license. Every housing developer must get license. Without license, they cannot operate uh, their housing development activities. Section 7, duties of licensed housing developer. They have duties and responsibilities under the law, particularly under this Act 118. They have to ensure that they have to be outdated from time to time, they have to provide all the relevant documents for check and examination by the officer of the Ministry of Housing and Local Government, etc. And Section 77A, eh, License Housing Developer to Open and Maintain Housing Development Account. This account is the account where all the monies of the bank lender and the purchaser are pulled into this account. And the inflow and outflow of this account is monitored and controlled by the specific uh, provision under this act. So, so any inflow or outflow of the money as a pool into this housing development control are subject to certain approval. For example, approval of the architect, approval of the bank manager, approval of the purchaser, for example. So the purpose of this provision is to protect the money of the purchaser from being misled or from being stolen or from being used 
unfairly by the housing developer. Apart from the statute, there are regulation. Apart from the statute, there are regulation. Regulation, housing development, tribunal flow, home buyer claims, regulation, housing development, compounded regulation just now. And I've already mentioned this just now in brief. And I would like to go to the statutory sale and purchase agreement. In Malaysia, under the Housing Development Regulation 1989, there are four types of statutory formatted sale and purchase agreement. This sale and purchase agreement contain terms and condition. Contain terms and condition which are mandatory for application by the developer. Developer, the developers have no right to creatively invent and draft their own agreement. They must follow, follow this mandatory sale and purchase agreement as provided under the Housing Development Act and regulation. What are the, these agreements? These agreements are specified under Schedule G, Schedule H, Schedule I and Schedule J. Schedule G and Schedule I are for landed property. It is not, not for strata high-rise properties. Landed property, single story or double story, while a Schedule H and Schedule J are for strata properties, flat, apartment, more than three stories, uh, properties. So a uh, Schedule G and Schedule I for landed property, the developer is under an obligation to complete the construction of the project and the house within 24, 24 months, two years from the date of sale and purchase agreement. While Schedule H and Schedule J, which are meant for apartment, flat and strata properties, the developer is under obligation to complete the construction of the building apartment within 36 months, i.e. within uh, three years from the sale and purchase agreement. If they, the developers, fail to complete uh, these properties within 24 months, uh, 24 years, uh, 24 months and 36 months, two years and three or three years, they will be subject to pay compensation. We call it here late delivery damages. Late delivery damages. Uh, that the developer must pay to the purchaser because of their failure to ensure the housing unit can be completed within 24 months or 36 months. Among the important terms contained in this Schedule G, H, I, and J, the statutory sale and purchase agreement are the developer must ensure that the property is free from encumbrances before the purchaser takes vacant possession of the said property. For example, encumbrances is maybe there are some charges or loan unreleased that affect the, the land concern. Example of encumbrances. Maybe encumbrances involve caveat or injunction of the court or court order which uh, which uh, cause which causes uh, this uh not uh, the title cannot be transferred to the purchaser or the purchaser cannot enjoy uh the property because of these encumbrances late payment charges default by purchaser and determination of agreement in this agreement also contain terms that provides if the purchaser default to comply for example they fail to pay install, installment payment to the developer on the prescribed dates, uh, they will be punished. For example, uh, they will be uh, terminated. Eh? Uh, we, uh, the, uh, the, the transaction with the developer will be terminated because of the failure and default of the purchaser. Further, there are terms on transfer of title eh? from the name of the developer to the, into the name of the purchaser after the purchaser having paid and complied with all the requirement and condition as required by law and by the agreement. Materials and workmanship to conform to description. 
Meaning that the developer must ensure that the housing building that they constructed must comply with the law, must ensure that after the housing unit have been completed, the housing unit can be occupied with safety and security fit for human habitation endorsed by architect and engineers that the house housing unit is fit for human habitation and the purchaser will be safe and secured when they occupy the building. If uh, within 24 months after the house has been delivered and given to the purchaser, we call it vacant possession, after vacant possession has been given to the purchaser, within 24 months after the VP vacant possession, if the developer finds, if the developer finds that they are defective workmanship, for example, uh, leaking to the building, uh, the way of construction is not good or bad construction, bad workmanship, the purchaser is given a right by law and by this agreement to claim compensation and damages or can request the developer to repair and make good whatever defective work found uh, within 24 months after the vacant possession. Then there is a term on time for delivery of vacant possession, 24 months or 36 months, depending on whether the property is strata title or a landed property. Developer is also under an obligation to obtain certificate of completion and compliance. Previously, it was known as a certificate of fitness for occupation. It means that this certificate is an evidence, a proof to, to show that the building is fit for human habitation. All the requirements like water, electricity, the way of construction, the method of construction, the quality of construction, the quality of workmanship have fully complied with the best practices. Uh, best practices is housing and in housing industry and construction industry, particularly as required by the Uniform Building Bylaw, which is originated from British Standard and American Standard. Hmm? The fire safety, everything, all the requirement that provide safety and security the occupant to the occupant has been complied with before a certificate of completion can be issued by the architect, and this indicates that the building can be used as an occupation, a place of occupation by the purchaser. And then there are also terms like manner of delivery of vacant position and defect liability period. Manner of delivery of vacant position means that the developer before they can hand it, they can hands over, they can hand over the completed building unit to the purchaser for the purchaser to occupy uh, the unit, we call it vacant possession, deliver the vacant possession of the unit, the developer must get uh, the certificate of completion on compliance, the developer must ensure water and electricity are provided to the building, the developer must comply all the requirement of best practices in housing construction industry and building industry uh, for uh, as uh, prescribed under uniform, uniform building bylaw, your UBBL, which is originated from the British standard in construction, as well as street drainage and building act requirements. Uh, these, are, uh, these are the obligation of the developer when they deliver vacant possession, i.e. deliver the housing and provide keys to the purchases for the purchases to move into the completed houses. Also, there's a provision and term on defect liability period. Defect liability period means it is 24 months within which the, the, uh, the purchaser has a right to claim compensation and has, has a right to request the developer to make good and repair any defective workmanship found within 24 months after the delivery of vacant possession of the house. So this one I've already mentioned in brief just now. Manner for delivery of vacant possession. So I want to discuss, this is the calculation of uh, late delivery damages where the developer must pay to the, the, uh, to the purchaser when the developer fails to, uh, to hand over the 
the completed unit for uh, for the, the for the purchases to move into the the completed uh, unit of the house. Let's say semi detached uh, house at the price of 100,000 date of sale and purchase uh, purchase agreement 1st January 2015 should be date for vacant possession 1st January 2017 24 months from 1st January 2015 actual vacant possession was delayed for 365 days huh? actual vacant possession was was on 1st January 2018 so 316 days delay on part of the developer. Because of a delay, the developer can be penalized uh, by paying compensation to the purchaser, aggrieved purchaser. Calculation of late delivery damages is like this. 10% multiplied by 400, divide by 365, and multiply 365, the purchaser can get 50,000 uh, damages compensation for late delivery of the vacant position if the semi-detached house uh, price is 500,000. So this is uh, calculation for strata property. Eh? 36 months, but the purchase, uh, the developer fails to deliver. It delays for 365 days. So the damages that the developer must pay is 50,000 as well. However, Early of this year, the Federal Court in Putrajaya through the case of PGD Regency Senan Berhad, where the developer in this case was challenged, eh? the court held that the date to calculate eh, 24 months or 36 months should be not from the date of sale and purchase agreement, but the date of the booking fees. If the, the booking fees is earlier, then the date and purchase uh, sale and purchase agreement, the court will rely on the date of booking fees. This decision of the court, I think, I think is to give protection to the purchaser and recognize their right and interest. Uh, booking fees paid on 1st January 2014, sale and purchase per January 2015, one year before the sale and purchase agreement, 20,000 paid. So the calculation start from 2014, not 2015, based on the new case decided by the federal court in PGD uh, case eh, earlier of this, uh, this year, 2021. So the calculation start, uh, start from the booking fees date. Eh. Similarly, similarly, also this is applicable for uh, SATA title where now the court will look at the date when the booking fees paid. Eh not from calculation not from the date of the sale and purchase agreement this is good to protect better and to provide a better protection to the purchases in malaysia late payment charges on the other hand the, the purchaser must ensure that when the developer requests them to pay the installment payment the purchaser without delay within 30 days of the request must pay the installment. Otherwise, they, the purchasers, can also suffer the penalty of paying compensation. For example, a semi-detached house at price of 100,000, the, uh, the developer uh, send written notice to the purchaser on uh, 1st uh, June 2015. This means the purchaser must pay 50,000 for the stage installment, eh? foundation of the state bidding, 10% of the purchase price under the third schedule. However, the purchaser delay 60 days. The purchaser will be penalized uh, for their delay. And uh, the calculation is like this, 10% multiplied by 500,000, multiplied by 60 days, divide by 365. The purchaser must pay late payment charges 8,000 ringgit. 8,219 ringgit. This is on part of the purchase. If the purchaser fails to pay promptly within 30 days from the date of the notice of the of developer to uh, for the purchaser to make payment for each and every uh, stage of uh, development. This is also a similar calculation whereby the, the, the purchaser must pay the penalty to the developer if uh, the purchaser fails to pay on time or within 30 days of the request. 
Defect liability period, or, or I also already mentioned just now briefly, uh, the right of the purchaser to claim compensation if within 24 months from the vacant position, uh, if the purchaser finds uh, defective works in their house. Uh, this is an example of defective, uh, crack, uh, uh, broken uh, ceiling, uh, leaking, uh, water leaking. This is maybe water leaking, this uh, damage to the electrical, uh, ele ele electrical apparatus and uh, facility. Uh, this is soil settlement, tanah mendap. Huh? So the defect liability period is two years. It's within two years or 24 months, the, uh, the developer must pay to the purchaser the damages. Uh, must pay uh, for the uh, defective workmanship or, re or repair the defective work found within uh, 24 months. So now the, the big problem is COVID. Eh? So how the government of Malaysia uh, lessen or reduce the pressure of the developer and uh, the purchaser uh, when uh, COVID happens in Malaysia? So the government has introduced specific statute temporary measures for reducing the impact of coronavirus disease 2019 Act 2020, Act 2021, COVID-19 Act. Eh? This Act is to provide temporary measure involving other statute and also activities under the Housing Development Control Licensing Act 1966. Eh? What are the special features of this statute? Late payment charges. So during the COVID-19 from 18 March 2020, and to an extended time until 31st uh, December 2020, the, the purchaser is not under obligation to pay any late payment charges if they delay in paying the installment payment within this period, 18 March 2020 until 31st December 2020. No late payment charges imposed on the uh, purchaser. Ladies and gentlemen, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alhamdulillah, Wow, it's great because this is the international seminar and then the presentation from the professor Hila is very detailed. So we can uh, know the point of view from the Malaysia sites. Yeah. The, one of the problem relating about the pandemic COVID. My presentations uh, will be bring with the broad view, yeah, not really detail. Uh, in the case like the Professor Hillard, hopefully this presentation will be give the other inspirations. So. I want to concentrate with the issue of the changing the challenge of the uh, during the pandemic and post the pandemic. Okay. Uh, first of all, I would like to say thank you very much yeah, uh, to the organizing committee, Professor Ali, who invited me to come to join, to share, to convey the speech. Yeah. He not speak in this prestigious seminar. I think this is one of the important uh, elements. Yeah, honorable and distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen. I think we are today in the epicentrum of the change. The pandemic has fundamentally changed many aspects of the life, society, and governments around the world. In that process of the change, knowledge, again, knowledge become one of the important factors that can be lead the change. Knowledge which gain from the result of research. So we now discuss the, uh, the result of the research to share to the other will become one of the important things. Because from this research, result of the research, hopefully 
we not only have map about the problems, but we can finding the alternative solutions for the interest of the human life problems or human being. This is one of the important. That is why, in my opinion, the field of the, our discuss, the study discussed in this seminar is very general, even is very general and cover of the various aspects. So, so many aspects business, finance, Islamic and religion studies, social and political science, education, linguistic law, development and environment, psychology and other social. This is, will give us the portrait of the challenge must be faced. And hopefully I already mentioned solutions in the form of the policy choices that need to be taken to overcome this problem we can find. This is one of the interesting issue is from the this seminar. I do believe that the world after COVID-19 is unlikely to return to the world that has, that was. And then if you look better and carefully, many trends already underway in the global economic are being accelerated by the impact of the pandemic in the many places and countries. So in my opinion, COVID-19 has reversed decades of progress as it threatens people and humanity. And then one of the impact COVID-19 has magnified the effects of poverty. So two years during the COVID, I think there's not only the accumulation of human toll continues to cause the concerns, even as a growing vaccine covers cover leaf sentiment, but also there is the high uncertainty surrounding the global economic outlook, yeah? especially related to the path of the pandemic. The international monetary funds, international banking mentioned clearly there is a contraction of activity during 2020 and 2021 is all of the condition is unprecedented in the memory of life on its speeds and synchronized nature. Some experts estimate the condition could have been much worse, even though it's hard to pinpoint precisely, but that some experts mention clearly, the contraction could have been more bigger, at least three times as large, if not for extraordinary policy, extraordinary policy taken by the government to minimize the potential of the impact. So much remains to be done to beat back the pandemic and avoid divergence in income per capita across economics and persistent increase in equality within countries. So not only poverty, but the problem of the inequality within the countries. In the year, last year, 2020, I think was the full of challenge for the world leaders. And then that challenge will be continue to occur in this year. And then for the next two, three years. Not only the leaders, the impacts, the match hits the citizen and business 
society. So that is why, that is why citizen and business nowadays are looking to their government leaders to help, to help them to navigate and emerge stronger from this large scale complexity problem. Presentation to present by Professor Hilal give us one of the problem hit the society, the citizens of the Malay. I think this is same in the every single country in the world. There is one survey. Yeah? Survey, this is related about the, what worries the world. This survey track public opinion about the most important social and political issues in at least 28 countries today. In addition, the result of the survey, in addition to the corona problem, there are several other problems that people are worried about. The result of survey give an overview of what people in 20 eight countries worry about today. Yes, of course, 37% afraid said that COVID is one of the top issue facing your country. But people mention, people are very concerned about the other several issues. What is that? Firstly, unemployment and poverty and social inequality. This is around 31% of it, 37%, but unemployment and poverty and social inequality, 31%. This is are the next biggest issue across all of our country. Besides unemployment and poverty and social inequality, there is the other issue. What is that? Financial and political corruptions. 29% crime and violence. So the pandemic not only hit the issue of the health, but we can find the other serious issue. Yeah, financial and political corruption, crime and violence. I will give you share information about condition of corruption uh, next. In the other research, there is fundamental issue that must be handled by the government. What is that? Not only economic, but the other one. If you are focused relating about the economic issue, you know, more than 463, 493 million full-time equivalent jobs must belonging in women and yacht were lost in 2020. You can imagine that. 493 million full-time equivalent jobs lost. And the global GDP declined 4.3%. Some experts mentioned the crisis may have been much worse if not from the government, the strong policy of the government interventions relating about these issues. Let me show you to the other issue in education sector. Temporary closure education in more than 180 countries at some point during the pandemic compounded the problem, keeping an estimate 1.9 billion students out of school. UNICEF estimates that as a result of a school closure, 24 million children have become dropped out, risks and many of the 370 million children 
who really on school meals could experience malnutrition. So education in the future must undergo a transformation process at all levels. This is will need like the combination of digital enablement, curriculum revisions, use the new learning methods, yeah, because we should use the online system. LMS, learning management system, should be prepared and should be upscaled. And then you, we should upscaling the, our college teacher, lecture, and indeed structural redesigns of the system of the education. Honorable and distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, I read one of the survey done by the Elderman Trust Barometer. The survey, the survey stated clearly that the world is facing a crisis of trust, crisis of trust in institutions across all sectors that show no sign of abating. In this survey, who researched by the Edelman Trust Barometer, in 20 out of the 28 countries surveyed, a threat trust in institution is less than, than 50%. You can imagine. Yeah? The citizens and trust with the government institutions. This is the reality across the world. This survey learn, discuss why the trust will become less than 50%. Indeed, there is many reasons behind this heightened sense of desertifications. The long tail of the global financial crisis, especially the transparency of the national budget, a perception that economy rewards, rewards are not being shared fairly, growing anxiety about future job problem, job uh, prospects. But there is one theme come up very repeatedly within the public discourse. What is that? That is the issue of the corruption. Dr. Bambang? Yes. I'm so sorry, you have two minutes left. Yes, okay, I do. The abuse of public office for private gain, this is one of the important issues. I do convince that corruption, but fits and is fit by the broader crisis of trust, which sustain a vicious cycle that undermines our economy, not only economy, health, democracy, law enforcement, and social cohesion. So corruption can also shift government spending away from valuable areas in health, education, social protection, and etc. In Indonesian context, corruption in social assistance carried out by the Minister of Social Affairs done in Indonesia. And then now in the public discourse in Indonesia, we're discussing about the potential conflict of interest in the procurement of the PCR. PCR, this is the tools as a method to examining of the SARS of COVID. Yeah. In the other issue, in the, uh, in, in the, the other issue in, in the unique context, after years of progress due to the development process, the coronavirus has caused poverty increase again. Not only one in 10 people of Indonesia currently are living below the national poverty. So the number of the poverty, no more than one digit in Indonesia. The other one, that is about the unemployment rate. This is a challenge not only for the national workforce, but in general, but also for the young people. 
young workers. The unemployment rates of Indonesian young workers relatively higher if you're comparing with the national unemployment rate. It is ever, it is even higher in the average of the global unemployment rate of young voters. The finally, especially for the educated academy of the university, honorable distinguished participant and other, from the entire description above in relation to the pandemic era, must be viewed from, a, we should use the positive thinking, yeah, positive perspective, because there are so many challenges that need to be concured and started from the reset where we discuss through this seminar. I think the result of the result will become one of the alternative policy. Of course, we need expertise from the broad, yeah, because we need the international cooperation. We need together to ensure a recovery and a global commitment for a resilient recovery. So finally, I would like to say uh, congratulations on joining the seminar. And hopefully there will be a lot of inspiration to be obtained from this seminar for the benefits of the human being. Untuk kemaslahatan, not only human being, but seru sekalian alam for the environment. But finally, Thank you very much for your attention. Allahu yaklul haq wa huwa yahdi sabil. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Dr. Bambang. It's a very powerful thought about how the challenge in pandemic, financial, political, political corruption, and unemployment. So I think we need to have a greater upper and wider perspective of bringing solution, especially from the research. I think that is the point uh, from you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Bamba. You're welcome. Okay, and then the third speaker, ladies and gentlemen, let's hear from Professor Madia Dr. Abdurrahman Radian Aji Haki from University of Islam Sultan Sharif Ali, Brunei Darussalam. Okay, Professor, are you here? Uh, I wait. Alhamdulillah. Okay. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> Finally, it's your turn. <laughs> okay, please, Professor, time is yours. Thank you very much. Muhammad Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Wassalatu wassalamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wa ala amma ba'd. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, Mrs. Ibu Arti Jarwati. Thank you for the introduction, and also thank you for the organizer, especially for from Professor Muhammad Ali Kulazaki, uh, Honorable Chancellor of Juanda University Juanda, Professor Martius uh, Rasa Mari, and also Director of uh, Juanda, Associate Professor Deg. Ladies and gentlemen, and also this is our. Uh, Distinguished uh, keynote speaker, Professor Nuaral. Uh, Professor Nuaral was my student at uh, International Islamic University at 1990s. Uh, now it is my pleasure that I can sit with him in the conference uh, in the conduit. And also welcome to uh, welcome to Bogor, Professor Nuaral. Bogor is my hometown. Ah, Bogor is my hometown. I'm living in uh, Sentul City there. Uh, welcome. And also to our uh, pro uh, Professor Bambang Wijayanta, who we know about his sepak <laughs> terjang in law in Indonesia. Uh, Allah bless, bless you. And also we want to speak today because the organizer uh, asked me to discuss about uh, what is that? To discuss uh, about uh, interdisciplinary. Uh, my my what is that? My uh, what is that? invitation is about disciplinary in this uh, COVID nineteen. 
uh, COVID-19. We, we can say era. Uh, we can say era what the 19 COVID-19 is. So it is about interdisciplinary. Therefore, I choose, uh, I prepare the presentation for this uh, conference. It is about the harmonization of Sharia and law as interdisciplinary phenomenon, Faculty of Sharia and Law, University Islam, Sultan Sharif Ali, UNISA. And it is my, as mentioned by Dr. Wijayanto, so it is one of the challenge in the COVID-19 era here. It is about the education. education. So we want to give an, a highlight about the education in Brunei Darussalam, especially regarding the harmonization of Sharia and law in our university. So this is our, because I was asked to discuss about interdisciplinary. I do not realize it is about the supporting the research in the tenancy of global tenancy. It is also maybe related to what I will discuss here, what I will discuss in this uh, uh, presentation. Uh, is about the uh, topic outline of my uh, presentation today. It is in 15 minutes. Introduction, harmonization of Sharia and law. Faculty of Sharia and Law, Unity Islam, Sultan Sharif Ali, Harmonization of Sharia and Law at the faculty, and will be concluded by a conclusion. As the introduction to expose, uh, to expose the what we can say, there's a what the uh, Christian and mission of University Islam, Sultan Sharif Ali, especially Faculty of Sharia and Law, at the biggest faculty at the Unity. Among the faculties, objective is the harmonization of Sharia law and law. It is the only program in the country. Brunei Darussalam has four universities: University Brunei Darussalam, University Islam Sultan Sharif Ali, University Technology Brunei, and College University Perguruan Ugama Sri Begawan. So UNISA has the to give. Uh, to uh, give the program relating to the law. Even the biggest university, University Brunei Darussalam, they do not have the uh, law study. The law study is given the responsibility, the responsibility to UNISA. The faculty has produced pro graduates since its uh, establishment in 2007. Uh, in 2007, they are now serving in various capacities, namely legal practitioners, Sharia lawyers, academicians, legal advisor, deputy public prosecutor, and members of the judiciary. So we want to know how about the harmonization, Sharia yeah, and the law. Sharia meaning Islamic law. Law, it is the uh, mandate of the conventional law. How the practice now in Brunei Darussalam after the establishment of UNISA, when we see in this uh, uh, time that um, Brunei Darussalam uh, people or Brunei Darussalam citizen nowadays they when they uh, discuss about law they will have two type of laws. It is about Sharia law and about the law. It is about because of UNISA's vision and mission. Uh, UNISA's vision and mission, especially the faculty of Sharia and law. Session in Arabic term as a tawfiq, which means to bring one, two or more different types of ideas into harmony or agreement with another. In this regard, it is about Sharia, Islamic law, and the law uh, itself. Since Sharia studies and research tend to receive greater attention, it is, in, it is a special task to address its research effort 
to harmonization the sharia and law so it is uh, this is the uh, task of sharia uh, and law at unisa to address this a research effort relating to the harmonization between the sharia and and the law and it is the practice now by uh, unisa and also by its graduate uh, by its graduate that uh, they nowadays in all uh, places in Brunei Darussalam when they discuss or uh, when they uh, uh, speak or when they uh, talk they will have two types of law sharia and, and law previously only when they said about law it is about the conventional law it is, they said conventional law only when the Sharia law, for example, ustaz or every day, they only speaking about Sharia law. They do not have anything about between harmonization, Sharia and law. No, for Sharia, for Sharia expert or Sharia people, they only speak Sharia. For conventional law, they only speak conventional law. But nowadays, after the establishment of the, especially faculty of Sharia and law. So in Brunei Darussalam, when they speak, when they talk, when they discuss, they will have two types of law in Sharia and law, not alone. Sharia alone only for Sharia or law for only for law. No. Nowadays they will discuss both. And is in the uh, Sharia and, and law. Faculty Sharia and law UNISA has a unique curriculum where Islamic law is taught alongside even conventional laws in its of law and bachelor of Sharia law, LLB and BSL undergrad program. It aims in producing students who are able to read both laws from a comparative perspective in order to work towards just laws and just legal system through harmonization of Sharia and law, which is Championed by balance. After this is caught, for example, uh, COVID-19, the benefit or the advantages from our graduates here, they they can explain what the people do, what the people must do relating or in facing the COVID-19 pandemic here. Why? From what side? either from Sharia law or from the conventional law. They will discuss and they will speak and they will explain both from the to, to what is done, to side or to disciplines uh, relating the COVID-19 pandemic. Okay, the vision of the faculty to produce this and qualified graduate who are able to use modern information technology in addressing the needs of Brunei society in the eras of Sharia and law. Because this is the faculty's vision that we can produce distinguished and qualified graduate who okay, can use the information technology. For example, nowadays in, in COVID-19 uh, pandemic, our study, it is not face to face. Now we study at home. Uh, online study, that uh, daring, uh, and student in any place. Even for example, foreign students who are in Singapore and in Malaysia, they study, still attend the, the classes at UNISA, but through the uh, Zoom platform or any other platform. As it is that, to uh, use modern information technology, in addressing the needs of Brunei society in the era of Sharia and, and law, uh, as it is the faculty of Sharia. The second vision of the faculty to produce high quality socio legal researcher to spearhead the faculty to become one of the leading Sharia and law research institution of the world. So, this is also our vision that we have socio legal researchers. Because, because our uh, students, they came from all over the world. Uh, they came from all over the world, so they, they can spread. Uh, they can spread 
all they have taken or they have taken benefit from our faculty to uh, the inter in international community. It's a community here that the faculty of Sharia and law uh, offers both Sharia and law programs at undergraduate and postgraduate level. Both the programs and courses offered by periodically reviewed and monitored by academic and experts to make them more relevant to the professional and social needs. It is their faculty. So it is periodically we our uh, what is that? our courses and our program was uh, reviewed uh, and also uh, was monitored by academic and expert. It's not only from Brunei, but also from other from outside Brunei Daru, Darussalam, especially from International Islamic University Malaysia, because we have a very close uh, relation relating to the uh, what is that? the program at Fakulti Sharia and, and Law. Many of our lecturers came from IUM, came from IUM. They will yeah, transfer the expertise from IUM, Kuliah of Laws, Ahmad Ibrahim uh, Kuliah of Laws, and they will practice in our faculty. Okay, for example, we have one of the undergraduate program, Bachelor of Law, LLB, and Bachelor of Sharia Law, BSL. Because our faculty, the name is Faculty and Law. So it is the, from the law, uh, what is that? Law program. In Sharia, Bachelor of Sharia in Judiciary, Fikih and Judiciary, Bachelor of Sharia, Fikih and Usu. It is in Sharia. But in law, we have this only Bachelor of Laws, LLB, Bachelor of Sharia, Sharia Law. This program is five years. This program is five, five, five years. That every student will have this, uh, will finish their study in five years and they will practice. Uh, they will pick with it five. And five years for them uh, for, for study and they will receive knowledge uh, from the harmonization, uh, from harmonization between Sharia and the law, uh, as we will see, uh, between Sharia and the law, as we will see in next uh, point. Then we have here also the, about the law at post, uh, postgraduate, we have LLM and also PhD. Uh, so uh, from Uni, UNIDA, they want to come to UNISA, you are welcome uh, to continue their postgraduate. Not only for law, we have also Arabic language, we have Usuluddin, we have Islamic finance, uh, we have uh, Islamic leadership, and also we have even the, what's the agriculture. Uh, we have also agriculture uh, uh, faculty uh, in UNISA. Look, the name is University, but we have agriculture. Dr. Yes. Abdurrahman, I'm so sorry, you have two, time, two minutes left. Inshallah, thank you. <laughs> so we have this, this two thing. So if you have uh, to continue your university, you can come to our. Session in our faculty, it is relating to the courses at the faculty and also relating to the research and community service. The courses for LLB and BSL, it is combined. If there is Islamic law of contract, so there is law of contract. If Islamic constitutional law, so we have also constitutional law. If law, we have also criminal, criminal law. If Islamic judiciary, you have also judi judiciary, the courses combined. Research, also the research, they will combine. And the research, our student, they will have to do research. It. Combination, harmonization between Sharia and, and law. And community service, the student, when they out, uh, out after also, they will discuss about the community service and the harmonization about Sharia and, and the, the law. So it is the harmonization at the faculty that we have three angels in the harmonization. It is about the courses and research and also the community services. 
is the explanation of this <laughs> supposed to have uh, a long dis discussion. But finally, uh, we have here that the faculty of Sharia in his way to harmonization uh, between Sharia and the faculty will provide quality Sharia and legal education with emphasis on acquisition of knowledge and skill and the use of information technology and also to inculcate students with the values of lofty morality and to produce competent and progressive graduates who will contribute toward the building of modern Brunei society and to cater for the needs of the Sultanate in this field of Sharia and law. And lastly, to produce quality researchers in the area of Sharia and law for the benefit of Brunei society in the particular and the Muslim community as a whole. This is uh, what I can share with you about the harmonization of Sharia and law at uh, University Islam Sultan Sharif Ali. Wallahu alam. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Abdurrahman. It is well, very interesting of the idea to harmonize Sharia and conventional law. Yeah? And you hope the harmonization is also become one of the key to face the challenge in pandemic. Okay. Um, I'm so sorry uh, for all the keynote speaker because I cannot proceed to the Q&A uh, since the time is very limited and we have to go to the next seminar. But I hope all the speakers are able to answer uh, the question in the chat box if there is any uh, question. Okay, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, next, I think I will read the uh, closing remarks for today's seminar. So the spread of pandemic is a happy challenge and affect all the country, include the housing and also all the sectors include the housing, economy, corruption, and also unemployment. And uh, we need to set solution in any forms to make everything back to work, even better than before, by strengthening the education to create a fully characterized person, uh, like anti-corruption person, and of course, strengthen and harmonize the law Islamic and conventional law. I think that's all for today. And ladies and gentlemen, before I end this session, as our appreciation for the inspiring speech for today, I would like to invite uh, our keynote speaker to receive the certificate virtually. Okay, operator, are you ready? Okay, the first certificate award to Professor Dr. Nurul Hilal Muhammad Dahlan. Thank you. Hello, University of Tara Malaysia. Thank you very much Thank for your you. sharing. Okay, and then uh, the next certificate for Dr. Bambang Wijoyanto from Juanda University. Oh, hold. Okay, we'll hold a minute. Okay. Okay. We we'll, we're still fine for Dr. Bambang here. Okay. If you find Dr. Bambang? Yes. Okay. Thank you so much. Dr. Bambang, you Yanto, thank you very much. Keep doing the right thing for Indonesia. <laughs> Keep optimist. <laughs> thank you very much, Dr. Bambang. And then uh, the last speaker, Professor Media, Dr. Abdurrahman Raden Aji Haki from University Islam, Sultan Sharif Ali, Brunei Darussalam. Okay, Aturnuhun, Bu. Thank you very much. Masya Allah. Nggak lupa yang bahasa Bogor ya. Thank you and hope to see you again next time. <laughs> Professor. Okay. Okay. okay and, uh, oh, I see. The, yes. And I see the certificate for myself. Thank you very much for the committee. <laughs> Okay, okay, ladies and gentlemen, and now we are heading to, I think that, uh, Alhamdulillah, I think the season for the speakers is already and for the BICSS. And next, ladies and gentlemen, we are heading to our second keynote speaker session for Bogor International Conference for Applied Science 2021. And yes, I see we are moderator for this session. And of course, as usual, we will say hello to the speakers. We have three speakers, the same as uh, the BICSS. The first one is Professor Insinyur Muhammad Ali Fulazaki, CSDEA. Professor Ali, are you here? Are you ready? Yes, yes. Yes. Uh, Professor Ali is the head of Writing Center, Journal University of Indonesia, best 15th 
uh, scientist and uh, from uh, Central Virginia University. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you will be the first speaker, uh, Professor uh, Ali, and then Dr. Bun Langste, Department of Geography and Land Management, Royal University of Phnom Penh, Cambodia. Dr. Bun Langste, are you here with us? Yes. Yes, I'm here. Okay, you will be the second speaker. And then uh, the third is Professor T.S. Dr. Suhaidi Hassan, PhD, PTEC, SMIEEE from Internet Work Research Laboratory, University of Utara, Malaysia. Dr. Suhaidi, are you here? Yes, yes, indeed, I'm here. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. Since all the speakers are ready, so we shall not wait for our first speaker. Professor Insinyur Muhammad Ali Fulazaki, uh, Professor? Screen is yours. Okay, thank you very much. I will share my presentation. Okay, you can see this presentation? Yes, it's clear. Okay. Hmm. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Today, um, I'd like to share with you, I think it's the most uh, important invention of my research. This is the application uh, of mass transfer factor in absorption, reabsorption, the chlorization, disruption and precipitation. This the important is here is I have developed a new model what we call mass transfer factor model or mass transfer factor equation. The history of the model is I developed this model when I studied in front. It's part of my PhD thesis and then because I work for Ministry of Public War in Indonesia, I just uh, present in a conference in Canada, in Montreal, in uh, 92. And then when I joined Swiss University in Malaysia, in University St. On, I published the first article in uh, Chemical Engineering Journal, this is the very, very good uh, journal in uh, 2011. And then I continue uh, for, uh, I developed a new, new, new model, uh, what we call uh, modified mass transfer factor model uh, in 2013. Yeah. And then continues again with many, many applications until now. So the principle of this model, you can see here that uh, if we have a pollution in water, uh, the pollution uh, location in bulk leakage, and then when <coughs> the pollution uh, moving from uh, the water to uh, material or porous material, we need to pass uh, three steps. First, we call the mass transfer, uh, film mass transfer. Uh, second is uh, porous diffusion, and the third is fixation. Fixation is very fast, uh, very uh, rapid, very quickly. So it's not be a content for the model. The model is just, uh, we want to see only film mass transfer and porous diffusion. And film transfer plus porous diffusion as we call global mass transfer. Uh, based on uh, this uh, observation, and then we need uh, some theory, the first is, what is we call a continuous equation. Continuous equation we can develop at the level of elementaries. This is very difficult 
because we need a very strong mathematics to, to, to develop the model. And the second is at level of system or part of system. And this is, uh, I developed this model is based on level of system. Uh, so we need to understand what is um, microscopic uh, balance. This according to uh, a diffusion of fixed law. Uh, this is uh, dif uh, difficult to, ex to explain because we need to understand elementary form dx, di, and dz. But if we uh, develop by microscopic balance, this more easily. In this case, we can uh, assume that the, the area of development of flat flow columns as a black box. And then we can identify uh, the equation is like this. And then when we see this uh, black box, and then we can understand that everything N3 in the black box is the same with everything departures from the global and everything at sub sound is removed and then we can develop this model and then by assumption uh, some uh, elementary uh, this to simplify the model and then we can write it like that and then the relation between external to global mass number is like that so the model that I have developed is I call mass transfer factor model. That uh, this model I call that I have published in many articles. So if you adopt my model, you can also call a Flazaki model, for example. Uh, this uh, this model I develop uh, based on the theory, or we call the theoretical equation. Uh, this uh, relation between uh, this uh, equation, we can simplify in uh, form of a linear equation. We can write Q uh, multiplied by ln t, that you have two uh, uh, slope and this one uh, uh, intercept uh, from the, the, the curve. Uh, we can uh, determine it, it from is from uh, the, the the result, and then uh, empirically, I develop a new model. Is only by chance uh, q to ln q, and the other is the same. This model also I have uh, uh, applied for many many research. That's very very good because uh, we have. Uh, application is more general than the first model that I developed. The purpose of this model, uh, we can see here, the first is uh, to understand uh, the kinetic and mechanism of mass transfer. But if we need to understand the mechanism and kinetic of mass transfer, many models have been developed it, yeah, in other many models, but uh, um, the other model we can see in this, the second point is uh, cannot determine the resistance of mass transfer. This is the unique of this model because our model, we can develop uh, the model to determine the, resp the resistance of mass transfer, which is located at film mass transfer or uh, porous diffusion. This is different with another model. And also we cannot do that. But many models just understand the uh, global mass transfer from uh, world water to uh, fixation. But I, my model can uh, uh, describe many things because we can separate from the film mass transfer and porous diffusion. And also for the next, we can develop new uh, equation again by correlate the mass transfer factor with director for performance. This uh, uh, for the next, I think we can develop that. And here we 
we can see the difference between these two models. Uh, this is the fundamental knowledge of uh, these two models. The first, uh, the MTF model, mass transfer factor model, I developed this the a theoretical equation, but ma modified mass transfer factor model is empirical equation. When I floating the MTF model, I floating Q versus Lante, but M MTF model, uh, ln Q plus uh, versus versus Lante, Lante, yeah. And uh, the application, the mass transfer factor model is just for a single solute, but uh, the modified mass transfer factor model, we can apply it for multivariate solutes. For the case, uh, the mass transfer, we can apply for the specific case, but uh, modified mass transfer factor model, we can apply for case in general, for example, if we find pollutant in a river, wastewater, and so on and so on. Uh, this model, we came to understand the variation of uh, external mass transfer, global mass transfer, and internal mass transfer. Uh, this we can float uh, versus or again percentage of, of the flow, time upon the solute, uh, accumulated solute release from the absorption and a percent of solute removal. Many, many can we can float this model, but this any other model we cannot find like that is very strong, a very strong model. Yeah, the flop is why a lot of uh, people have already uh, cited this model. And the tip of reactor type of reactor for running the experiment, we can do it in batch experiment and also column experiment. For example, the old model like Langmuir model, French list model, maybe just for batch reactor. But this model, we can, many, many uh, type of reactor, we can um, uh, apply this model. This is very, very interesting for the use of this model. So, this model, uh, we can understand, we can study, we can describe uh, everything uh, regarding the mechanism and kinetic uh, of absorption, desorption, biosorption, phase pressure, and decolorization. For desorption, we not yet to test this model with decolorization, but I suggest you can, if you have the data, to uh, apply this model for the case of desorption. And then we can see some uh, uh, results that have applied with this model. The first, for the case of absorption of single solute into forest material. And this I have published in Chemical Engineering Journal in 2011. Uh, this, uh, the, the, the floating is, you can see, the form of floating is, uh, like that, uh, and then uh, I have also uh, uh, developed for the absorption of atacin and cimesin into granular activated carbon, and you can uh, see also I have been, uh, uh, published in analytical method, and I have also. Uh, this was for, for modified uh, mass transfer factor model. Uh, I developed in 1913. Uh, this uh, applied for uh, water in the lagoon in Batu Pahat, uh, Malaysia, that I have published in Chemical Engineering Journal also. But I have also another case uh, for addition of phosphate. This in literate, literate is uh, like stone. I find it in the campus of UTM, Malaysia. I published also uh, all this model is applicable. And I have also uh, applied for bioception. Bioception is uh, interesting also. 
There is uh, the first I applied for by so son of oil in Greece to def, uh, to 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 develop biomass in a package batch column reactors, and I published also this article. It is for the case of um, early wastewater. Uh, I the case uh, study is from one industry in Batu Fahak. I applied this uh, my student when I. Uh, teach in UTHM, uh, my student who, who do this uh, research. And then also I apply for bioassociation of organic matter to develop aerobic granule in sequencing batch reactors. And also this another student who uh, work uh, for this uh, research and also biosource of nitrogenous matter and also biosource of forest matter is one student uh, who do that. And also we can apply uh, another case of this model for photocatalytic activity. This for deposition of single solute. This uh, also uh, the case study of my postdoctoral uh, student from Iran who worked with me in UTM. Uh, this uh, in batch reactors. It's, I have published also this, uh, this article in Chemical Engineering Journal. And the last one, but not less, yeah, because we have another research also. Uh, now I submit uh, two articles uh, uh, by applying this model. This is the case for colorization of uh, uh, Rhinosa brilliant blue. This uh, by using fungi to, to, to remove uh, day from uh, water. From this I have published also in biotechnical biotechnology reports, the article. This many, many case I have uh, uh, apply this model. That's why. That's why I want to share this model with you. I think uh, for the next time you can, uh, if you have time for your research, you can apply my uh, model to your research. The important thing is the application of this, uh, this uh, uh, equation. You should have the accumulation of uh, something of pollutant in, for example, in porous material or in uh, bacteria or removal everything or dissolve, dissolve it everything, but you have something uh, accumulative amount. This is the important. And then when you plot accumulation again time or again percentage of outflow again everything that I have explained you before, then you can use this model. This uh, new, new new concept or new idea if you want to analyze your data with uh, my model. Uh, Prof. Prof. Yes. Ali? Yes? Okay, you have two minutes left. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Please <laughs> I have uh, published uh, for this model. It's uh, some citation. Uh, for the model, as many many citations already been I have published this model for in the high quality journal. I think it's uh, become an idea for you all if you want to apply this model. I uh, I'm now for for the conclusion that the first is uh, the use of mass transfer factor and modified mass transfer factor model can be useful to describe mechanism and kinetic of solute removal by many type of engineering system. The second trend curve of mass transfer factor for different engineering process are different from each case of study. Yeah. Can, I have shown you many, many research that I have do that. And a number of citation of the article that I published uh, regarding this model is uh, more interesting for the people to read 
than other of my article because I have published more than 80 article, but this article is more concentrated people to, to read them. The perspective of this uh, model is the application of mass transfer factor model or modified mass transfer model can be expanded to cover a wide range of engineering system. This is the first. And the second, the application of this DES model need to be extended to describe mechanism for deception because I not yet apply that for deception. Maybe for your case, you can do that. And the third, determination of the Zen parameter can be proposed, proposed for the correlation between muscle factor and reactor performance. Because the, for engineering system, we need to understand the performance of reactors to remove pollutants and so on. And, so. and this is uh, my presence today. And I thank you for your kind attention. And thank you very much, Arti. Okay, thank you very much, sir. So you have find and proposed an optimal static equation model, yeah, of mass transfer for kinetic and mechanics of solute removal. Okay, okay. I think that is that will be very useful technically for a uh, kind of engineering, yeah, uh, sir. Okay, and next we have Dr. Bun Lang Se from Royal University of Phnom Penh. Dr. Bun Lang Se. Yes, I'm here. Okay, are you ready, doctor? Yeah, you hear me well, right? Well, very well. Okay. Very well. Please okay, uh, let me let me share uh, my slide presentation first before I present myself. Okay, yes, please. Okay, uh, oh, sorry. What's it? Okay. Yes, first of all, I would like to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Bun Leng uh, Se. I'm a lecturer in the Department of Geography and Management in Phnom Penh, Cambodia. And uh, uh, today I would like to present uh, a little bit for my preliminary result of uh, our research, uh, the focus mainly on the impact of urbanization of urbanization, uh, urban uh, heat islands in Phnom Penh, Cambodia. Uh, actually, I'm uh, a KSS uh, fellow. Uh, KSS stands for Center for Commerce Studies in Cambodia. And um, I am a, a group leader of a, a climate change and water group in the Department of Geography and Management. And uh, this is our topic today to present. So the, the content that covers today is uh, uh, five main points, introduction and objectives of the research method and methods. And this is, as I said, is a, a primary results. So I have a question uh, two or uh, four points in urbanization development in Cambodia, especially in Phnom Penh. Uh, temperature difference, uh, ventilation, uh, oven speed in uh, the uh, urban sitting, and uh, uh, urban heat islands. Uh, the last one is a uh, conclusion. So let me in the, uh, give introduction. Uh, actually, uh, when we talk about urban heat in, in the city setting, uh, it's normally of course, on urbanization. So urbanization can, can cause by uh, increase or population growth, economic growth, uh, city size because of a population uh, uh, growth and, and path routes or improvement surface and building so on. So all of this also affects with uh, the urban settings or increase the air temperatures, decrease the relative humidity. And all of this, uh, always affects on urban islands, intensity or characteristic in the city setting, a city uh, setting, yes. And let's see the urban islands also reduce the ventilation because of, uh, how I could say, uh, narrow buildings, a narrow street and a high uh, dominated buildings, uh, high buildings and also uh, decrease and increase the uh, uh, urban heat islands intensity, especially in the central business centers. And the urban, Urban heat islands normally affect the thermal, affect the comfort and health of urban people, and improvement of quality of life, especially has a, uh, impacts on uh, people, especially you could say uh, uh, thermal comfort. Why? This is uh, 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 some how I could say uh, is this a statement because of the. Uh, uh, a growth of urban population in the Phnom Penh, you could see 2012, it's just only 1.85 uh, 
million to 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 point one hundred twenty nine millions in two thousand depends on the national in tissue national in tissue and statistics in Cambodia, and the problem is like rural migration, rural rural urban migration. We could see the number here is nineteen point five percent in two thousand eight to twenty one point four percent in two thousand thirteen. And in 2020, it's 22.0%. So they expected that the increase of uh, uh, population in the city to be 36% by 2050. So this, this could be to increase the, the economic activity in the city, like uh, transportation, half business centers and industrial base. So all of this also affects with uh, urban growth. You could see the number here is uh, uh, in, in 1973, the, the, the urban size is only 30 kilo square kilometer to 40 square kilometer in 1990 and 220 kilo square kilometer in 2015. And today, the, the urban expansion or sprawl to become 600, 78.46 square kilometer. So all of this could change the land use and land covers in the cities, in the city landscape. And this could cause big urban heat island phenomenon. The objective is studies uh, overall is to identify the influence of urbanization on urban heat islands in Tanzania and Phnom Penh. And we have two more specific objectives to determine the distribution of an effect, urbanization effect to urban air temperature change and wind velocity, and to ascertain the relation between urban, urbanization and urban island effect. The material we also use it and methods, like here we also install three vegetation in different places in a city or within the city. Uh, uh, this is a vegetation we installed it in Posente or UP2 mineral, uh, uh, Royal University of Phnom Penh Campus 2. And another one is like in uh, uh, American University of Phnom Penh. And another one is like in uh, FFI, Min Phong Nan Phra International. So we, in, we also install, install three vegetation in, in order to record or observe the data. So we, we, the data we observe uh, all of this, but I would like to address only two parameters, air temperatures and wind spin wind direction here in order to analyze urban islands. And the method that we use is depends on OK 1973 and uh, Steph uh, F. Vern et al. 2011. We use urban heat island uh, uh, temperature and urban area minus a temperature um, suburban area. And the average, uh, sorry, uh, the rate of the urban heat island effect can be calculated by equation below here. Uh, the urban heat island percentage, uh, mean, the data U, data urban area minus data suburban area and, and uh, device urban uh, delta urban area. So the wind speed we also calculate as average wind speed. Here. So the primary is, uh, as uh, you are though not, not in Cambodia, but other urban setting uh, over uh, spread because of the uh, uh, population urban growth, urban growth because of the population growth. So the land use in Cambodia, especially in Phnom Penh, here's a Phnom Penh map, City, and this is also map show uh, the landscape or land cover. And uh, this is uh, like this this color. This color is a uh, uh, agricultural area, and artificial is mostly dominated buildings in the 1993 uh, or 2003, and 2007. So it's been changed. First race, mostly in the building dominant, dominant. and a high rise building, mostly in central business like FFI. Here, you could see the location that we already installed uh, with the station. And narrow, you could see the narrow is also narrow, uh, narrow streets that affect that affect ventilation and also led to increase in urban heat intensity in, in city. So, uh, the, based on uh, our observation. In those areas, urban areas and suburban areas, you could see the temperature differences uh, between those, between uh, uh, the three, three locations. 
suburban area in Poston, the Royal University of Phnom Penh Campus 2, the mean max temperature is 13.1 degrees Celsius and mean 2.7. And sorry, um, uh, mean, yes, uh, maximum, minimum, and uh, mean uh, average is uh, 9.2 degrees Celsius. But when we compare this to uh, uh, central business centers like FI for now and Flora International, the maximum maximum temperature is 15.1 degrees Celsius and minimum is 2.9, a little bit different. But you can see the mean is uh, uh, different from the sub urban area as well as uh, uh, recycle American University of Phnom Penh. You could see here. Then this is the graph, uh, the, the temperature difference of uh, three location. Uh, just observation, you could see uh, the central business is a higher temperatures than the suburban area that divide, defined by uh, the development or urban development, urbanization development in the city. This is in the city scales. So just an observation from uh, uh, mid to the end of August, we had so most of the times, uh, series times scale, uh, the temperatures also increase in uh, uh, central business centers, especially in uh, FFI uh, location uh, with the station. So uh, indicated that a uh, higher temperature happens there compared to the suburban areas. Then we observe uh, when wind direction and wind uh, characteristics. Normally, uh, Cambodia, as a uh, like other country in South Asia, uh, affected by uh, monsoonal regimes. Uh, this is the southwest, yes, the southwest uh, winds and the north, northeastern wind. So. This is some uh, the location we installed here, so it affects a bit the ventilation because of the central business of the city, also high buildings, dominated high buildings, and also a narrow street. And so the wind uh, was blocked. The wind, the wind has been blocked by the buildings. And so uh, the heat also increased in the, sub, in the central business. By observation, uh, ventilation, uh, as you already know, uh, plays uh, uh, crucial rules or important rule to reduce the internal the intent intensity of the uh, urban heat island in city scale. So, depend on the weather uh, station observation indicated that more urbanizing area are very low wind blow compared to the suburb areas. So, just a, some indication is in the same terms, uh, wind blow here uh, in FI and yeah, wind blow here. Sorry, wind blow here and and. Uh, in uh, uh, American University of Phnom Penh and uh, Royal University of Phnom Penh. So a little bit different here. So it's the calm wind flow and this is a little bit more uh, wind. And this uh, wind is higher than other areas in the uh, uh, Royal University of Phnom Penh campus too. So for ventilation, uh, uh, depend on the record or observation for wind ventilation or wind uh, speed, you could see, observe that uh, a high wind speed uh, happen in uh, American, sorry, uh, uh, Royal University of Phnom Penh campus two, a maximum is 7.8 uh, meet, yeah, uh, meter per, uh, per second. And the mean, minimum ventilation is uh, 1.4. But we compare to uh, FFI, just only 3.1 3 uh, meter per second. And the minimum is 0 0.4. So could indicate that, uh, uh, suburb area uh, experience uh, a strong wind than a uh, central business area. So uh, uh, maximum wind ventilation when you observe this mostly in uh, the suburb area, especially with a uh, 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 wider space, wider spacing is uh, higher wind speed than than the suburb areas. You could see the graph here. This graph here is like FFI. This is the central business centers. So, so some central business is also uh, low wind speed than suburban area like American University of Phnom Penh and Royal University of Phnom Penh. Then we combine together between uh, temperatures difference and wind speed. You could observe that 
Yes, it's a like O U P P. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. F F five here. You could see it in below bin speed. And when you talk about the temperatures, you could see contrast is also higher than the other area like suburb American, uh, American University of Phnom Penh and rural University of Phnom Penh. And heat islands, we can say heat islands, urban heat islands, it also increase either when we compare both two, mean uh, urban heat island uh, temperature, FFI, mean temperature urban area, FI, and a temperature of suburb area mi minus this, you could see a little bit higher uh, or could see be a little bit higher in August and compared to with the uh, urban heat island sub above between uh, uh, FFI and AUVP. And the rate, the rate is normally is uh, not much, just around uh, 0 0.13% uh, percent contribute to regional uh, climate, climate change. Yes, regional climate in the region, no, regional urban climate. So uh, this is a key findings that we found during uh, eight months of observation, eight month observation by weather station. The temperature difference is uh, percentage or, or uh, Royal Sea of Phnom Penh compass two is 9.9.2 .9 degrees Celsius. Uh, Recycle and AUPP American University of Phnom Penh is 9.5. And Bang Ping Kong, like FFI, 10.5 degrees Celsius. So uh, a little bit different one degree, we could say one degree uh, uh, degree Celsius of the three, uh, mean, uh, three locations. And the difference of the wind speed, we could see as we are uh, higher, I mean, higher at uh, uh, Bang Ping Kong, we can compare with uh, or UPP2 and yeah, well, 1.78 meter per second. And the second banking call uh, in Banking Kong is 1.14 uh, meter per second. But interestingly, like, uh, uh, the intensity of urban heat island also increased when compared both. Both I mean refer to uh, uh, FFI and and uh, UPP is 1.3 degrees Celsius. But FFI and recycle just one, 1 1.0 degrees Celsius. The increased rate is around uh, 1 point, sorry, uh, 0 0.1, uh, 13 uh, uh, percent in average, be, uh, mean between within both areas, but a little bit different when we observe with the maximum, the maximum temperature rate is like uh, uh, 0 0.44 percent and banking coin and uh, recycle just uh, 0.72%. So thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much for Dr. Bunang say. So you compare three areas, yeah, and it's conclude that urban growth not only, of course, have positive impact, but also bring negative impact in climate change which is the air temperature because uh, getting higher yeah, than before. And uh, of course, we need a solution for this negative impact in the future. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Bun Lang Yeah, thank you so much. Okay, and then let's move to our last speaker for today. Professor T.S. Dr. Suhaidi Hassan, PhD, PT, S-M-I-E-E-E. -E -E. Okay, Dr. Suhaidi, are you ready? <laughs> I cannot hear your voice, Dr. Suhaidi. Uh, okay, I think there's a little bit problem with the speaker. Can, can, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, I can hear you clearly right now. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, a while. Okay, uh, wait a minute, uh, it seems uh, we have uh, Can you see the full screen? 
Yes. Uh, actually, it's not full screen yet, but I think it's still clear enough. Uh, I don't know why. Is this I think it's PD in, in, is it in PDF or in PowerPoint, sir? Uh, in the in, uh, PowerPoint. Uh, it was. Oh, okay. Yeah. I think it's okay. It's okay. No problem. <laughs> we still, uh, we still see it clearly. Let me let me try again. Okay. To share the probably the screen. Yeah, yeah I think yeah. it's is it okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's full screen. Yes. Yeah. Okay, uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and very good afternoon uh, to all uh, distinguished uh, participants of this uh, uh, conference. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the uh, conference organizer for uh, inviting me to this uh, uh, session and I would like to present uh, uh, a title, uh, a keynote speech about the trust framework of user authentication for the internet of the future. So today we are going to talk about uh, the internet of the future. I wish I will not be uh, delving into the details uh, of this uh, uh, topic here yeah, because uh, of the uh, spectrum of the uh, audience. Yeah? So uh, if uh, any of the uh, participants uh, would like to know more about this work, yeah, please kindly uh, send me an email, contact me. Uh, I, will, uh, more than, I will be more than happy to actually uh, to share the information about this talk. Yeah? So uh, let us begin with this uh, dua. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Subhanaka la ilma lana illa ma'allamtana illa ka antal alimun hakim. Glory be to you. We have no knowledge except what you have taught us. You are truly the all-knowing, all-wise, ya Allah. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Suhaidi Hassan. I'm a professor of computing network uh, in uh, University of Tara, Malaysia. Uh, I'm a founding chair of the uh, UUM Internet Network Research Laboratory. Uh, I'm also the past president and the founding member of Internet Society Malaysia. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm also involved uh, globally as the uh, fellow alumni of the Internet Engineering Task Force. And uh, I'm also work, uh, contribute my work uh, occasionally yeah, in the uh, organization called ICANN, the Internet Corporation for assign name and numbers, assign name numbers, which is uh, an important organization uh, in the governance of the internet. Yeah? Uh, I also serve as the founding member of the uh, uh, IPTA. IPTA is the Institution of Higher Learning Distributed Ledger Technology Consortium, uh, which is under the Ministry of Higher Education in Malaysia. Uh, I have uh, been in the career as academician since uh, 1991, uh, that is uh, 30 years ago. And uh, alhamdulillah, I have uh, supervised uh, successfully 28 PhD students that graduated uh, from more than 15 countries in the area of computer and communication network. Uh, and I'm a husband of one, father of five, and granddad of one. Yeah. So uh, that is a little bit introduction of myself. Yeah, I hope uh, knowing me, uh, we will, will have more opportunity to collaborate uh, uh, in the future. Uh, so today, uh, my talk is about the future of the internet. Yeah, uh, We know during this uh, pandemic, COVID-19, uh, internet has become a very, very important tool yeah, for uh, our communications, uh, managing our daily life, as well as for education. Yeah, so uh, we in this time of uh, hardship, yeah, uh, we rely uh, totally. Yeah, we rely mostly on the internet. Yeah, for spreading information and so on. So uh, I would like to share. Yeah, my some of my experience and some of my thoughts. And uh, in this work, actually, uh, the title of my presentation is actually come from uh, one of uh, the PhD project yeah, undertaken by one of our uh, PhD students yeah, uh, in our research lab. Yeah? Uh, 
which is about the internet architecture yeah, of the future internet. Yeah. So uh, how, what the future lies, yeah? what the future lies, so how, how we uh, move into the future of the internet. So that is the, 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 the gist of my talk. Yeah? I hope uh, this is uh, to give the idea of where we are heading to and, uh, uh, and, and, and I hope this uh, could uh, uh, give sh uh, could shed some light yeah, about, uh, about where we are heading to about the internet technology. So let us look into the evolutions of the internet. Yeah? So uh, how we move into the future? We look at the past in the 14th to the 18th century, yeah, where we have the sea routes actually discover distant land. Yeah, we have uh, people from China, for example, trading in Malacca. Yeah, uh, from uh, uh, the the traders yeah, from uh, uh, the European country, the European continent, uh, continent. Yeah, uh, came to uh, Indonesia, for example. And then we move to the uh, uh, 18th century afterwards to the 19th century. Uh, we have the electricity that propels yeah, the industrial revolutions yeah, that help to uh, get into what we call the industrial revolution uh, from the dark area of the European uh, uh, region at the moment, at that time. And then we move to the 1960s to the 2020s. Yeah, we have the era of the internet, yeah, where we have the internet that connects humans and things. Uh, we're still enjoying this, and now we are moving into the future yeah, of the internet. Yeah? So uh, in this era, uh, the intelligent devices drive the global economy. So this is the overall, I would say, uh, evolution of the internet. And we'll talk this in conjunction with the fourth industrial revolutions that affect almost every facet of business sectors and arena. Yeah? For example, in terms of security, when we talk about uh, risk, uh, currently we talk about cyber, cyber security, probably yeah, in, the, in the years to come, we'll talk more on the IoT security. Yeah? Uh, when we talk about transaction, yeah? uh, we have centralized repository, for example, in banking systems and so on. Well, in the future, we will talk more on the trusted uh, technology like blockchain technology. Uh, and blockchain technology is not just for the currency, yeah? it's just for the uh, transactions. And uh, uh, what, we, what we say blockchain so far, we just, uh, we just know about the uh, you know, Bitcoin uh, and et cetera. But it is not only meant for the currency, but it is, meant for the uh, transaction as a whole. Yeah? Um, uh, the interface, if we now use buttons, for example, in the future, we will use more voice, gestures, and so on. Yeah? Uh, in decision making, uh, if we now we use uh, data and spreadsheets, and in the future, we'll be uh, using more intelligence, more artificial intelligence, augmented intelligence, yeah? to actually gather the data and make decisions. And mobility, for example, yeah. If we have uh, the taxi driver nowadays, then in the future we expect to have more autonomous uh, driving uh, uh, vehicle, for example, trucks, yeah, uh, buses, yeah, and uh, and and these are connected to the internet, yeah. Uh, as well as the factories, if we now have humans, in the future we'll have robots, and and uh, get ready to be. Uh, to be uh, replaced by the robots. Yeah? And then, then the robots is not only in the factories, even we find them in the restaurants. Yeah? We find them in the house, in our house. So uh, this is the effect of the industrial revolutions, the post industrial revolutions that comes uh, together with the uh, future of the internet. Yeah? So uh, when we talk about the future of the internet, uh, there are two things that characterize the future of the internet. One is uh, the aspect of the connectivity, and another one is the aspect of intelligence. So when we talk about the connectivity, yeah, we are talking about the G waves of the wireless connectivity. We are talking about the advanced connection linking the cities 
and uh, uh, the cities of the world, yeah, um, uh, the, in the in the wireless or in the uh, uh, mobile context, we are talking about the three Gs, the four Gs. Now uh, in Malaysia, we are rolling out the five G uh, environments, yeah, uh, to connect the mobile for things. And uh, in the next ten years, yeah, even now uh, I have uh, in our lab we have students who are exploring on the 6G, yeah? the mobile for machines uh, com communications, yeah? and how uh, the limitations of 5G, even though we are not in the 5G area yet, but we are uh, researching it uh, seriously at the moment. And in terms of intelligence, yeah, we have this augmented intelligence, the AI, yeah? machine intelligence, yeah? the intelligence behavior by machine. Uh, we know Sophia, yeah? The, the robot lady yeah, that can mimic the human very well. Yeah? Uh, so uh, be careful, yeah? man, yeah? of this, uh, this kind of uh, invention. So when we talk about the internet of future, yeah, what are the elements of this internet of the futures? So uh, we have the broadband connectivity, we have the smart devices, cloud computing, all these names uh, that we sometimes do not know yeah, uh, in details what they are, but this appear in our life. Advanced data analytics, IoT and robotics, yeah, artificial intelligence. So what are all these means? Yeah? It means that in toward the future, all things are sensed. Yeah? So we sense a physical world, we map it into the digital signal, yeah, temperatures, we have space, uh, we have touch, the sense of sense, a smell, smell, and so on. And probably uh, in the future, yeah, we can have uh, the smell transmitted over the internet. Yeah, and we have all the things connected. Yeah, the world is so ubiquitous. Yeah, data will go online to power machines intelligence. Yeah, uh, ubiquitous connections, wide connection, multiple connections deep connections, all these kind of connections. And one of these important characteristics is all things intelligence. Yeah? And this, uh, the marriage of the network technology and the uh, artificial intelligence will be the key characteristics of the internet of the future. Yeah. Uh, so this is, uh, this is one of the things yeah, that we need to to know and nowadays we have this yeah we have people spying other people not only not not through the the the, 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 the physical spying yeah but they do it uh, during uh, using the artificial intelligence yeah and so on so what drive all this yeah we have two uh, we have uh, the business and global mega trends yeah that drive all this uh, uh, change yeah toward the future yeah so, uh, for example, the business and the global mega trends, we have uh, globalization, the digital transformation, the issues of sustainability, yeah? uh, the uh, process automations, and also the business uh, resilience. Yeah? On the other hand, we have the technology trends. Yeah? We have new application models, yeah? uh, the verticals, yeah? uh, the IoT, yeah? the artificial intelligence, the mobility, uh, immersive experience, cybersecurity, yeah, all these actually drive yeah, what will happen in the future of the internet. Yeah? And this is just a scenario of the intelligent city connected to the internet. Yeah? We have pack of sensors, we have pack of, uh, you know, uh, of, of co uh, connections uh, that will help us hopefully to live better. Yeah? Hopefully to live better. I mean, yeah. Uh, and what are the values here? Yeah? I identify the eight technology values uh, that will be delivered uh, out of uh, this. Yeah? First one is uh, uh, in terms of assistance. Yeah? We, when we move into the future, uh, more and more people are getting old and this technology can bring the value of assisting uh, all these people. Yeah? Uh, connectivity, yeah? we have advanced connectivity, we have advanced uh, uh, health uh, uh, applications, for example, the intelligence, uh, the intelligence uh, equipment, yeah, that will help us to communicate better, yeah, 
um, uh, even now, for example, uh, uh, 10 years ago, maybe or for a few years back, or even before the COVID, we, we never think about having a conference like this where I can speak uh, in Malaysia and the listeners uh, uh, in all over the world. Yeah? Uh, Personalizations, yeah? uh, security, sustainability, and user creativity. So all these are the technology values yeah? brought by uh, what we expect yeah? when we move toward the future of the internet. So uh, in terms of technology, how do we move uh, into the future? How, how actually the involvement yeah, uh, happen? Yeah? For example, in the past, if you want to connect to the internet, I still remember I have to connect uh, to the internet. Yeah? In the 80s, when I first get my connection to the internet, uh, I have to connect it to the dial-up uh, uh, dial uh, connections. Yeah? Uh, my modem is uh, just 2.4 kilobit per second. Yeah, that connects me to the internet, to the entire world. Yeah, and at that time, it's so primitive. Yeah, it is a circuit, circuit switch. The content is very limited. The applications are very limited. But we move as we move to the present. Uh, we use the packet switching technology that brings us, yeah, bring us a better uh, connectivity. Yeah, with a more richer content of the internet. We have the hyper uh, multimedia content. Um, and then uh, these are limited, yeah? the present internets are limited by the IP addresses, yeah? which is the identifier of the internet. Yeah? We have the IPv4 and IPv6. Yeah? So we, uh, we have to uh, address ourselves before we can find ourselves. But moving into the future, uh, uh, more interesting will, be ha will happen yeah? because the future will be based on the, uh, what we call, uh, the content centric networking, yeah, uh, with uh, hypermedia content, yeah, the augmented intelligence, yeah. So, how do I describe all this, uh, the, the future with uh, the content or name centric internet, yeah? Imagine that nowadays, if you want to buy something, we need to identify where we want to buy that things, yeah. For example, if you want, want to buy this, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, nasi apa? Penyek, yeah? apa? Ayam penyek, yeah? So we need to 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 identify the restaurant, yeah, uh, Wong Solo or something, yeah, to that 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 sells this ayam penyek, yeah. But uh, perhaps in the future, if you want to have something, uh, we just uh, uh, imagine in our mind, and the thing will be delivered to us, yeah. So uh, that is definitely not ayam penyek lah. Uh, that should be probably the in terms of uh, information, in terms of uh, uh, application, for example. So uh, in the future, we will not be uh, host-centric anymore, but it is more content-centric. Yeah? And the, uh, the uh, technology is moving toward that. Yeah? We are uh, asking what we want instead of where the information is. Yeah? So this is uh, some of our contributions. Yeah, uh, in the in the past, yeah, we have uh, written um, uh, some document. Yeah, contributed to the ITUT, which is uh, the International Telecommunication Union. Yeah, uh, on 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 the issue on the uh, catching. Yeah, the network catching. Yeah, the storage in the internet. Yeah, if we have, if we look at the present situations. Yeah, where we have. Uh, this uh, content request is made to the content server. Everybody is made to uh, this requesting uh, the content from content server and the identifier is using the IP. But in the future, you see the content will be more ubiquitous. Yeah? Uh, everybody, even now, uh, we can con create the content and we can share it on the internet. Yeah? So this trend will continue and will drive the change of the technology. But now the issue is who can create the content and how we can trust the content. So this is actually what I want to, uh, I want to highlight in this, uh, in this uh, uh, presentation. Yeah? So the issue will be the digital trust elements of the future internet. Yeah? So uh, we will have in the future the name, the, name, the sign content. Yeah? So that, you know, 
the one content, the content that we find in the inter internet uh, is available from actually the one we trust. Yeah. So how do we do this? So definitely we need to use technology like the blockchain technology yeah, that will be, uh, will be uh, providing yeah, the mechanism to ensure yeah, uh, it is a signed content. Yeah? We do not want to, for example, to install application in our systems. Uh, and it turns out that the applications come from the uh, malicious source yeah? uh, that will, uh, that will uh, uh, disrupt our, our, our computer, that will destroy our computer, our data, and so on. Yeah? And uh, uh, another element is the provenance. Yeah? So we want to make sure that whatever we trade in, the transaction that goes through the internet would be, uh, we know, the asal usulnya, yeah, uh, the, the the provenance, yeah. Uh, we know it is built on the data signatures and straightforward key distributions. Uh, and then, uh, in terms of data persistence, yeah, we want it to be uh, able to uniformly access, yeah, pervasive storage, yeah. And this will be the model for the future. And then, this is what we are doing, yeah. Uh, actually, we are proposing, yeah. Um, a, a trust-based authentication for the future, yeah. So that uh, uh, whoever, yeah, creates the content, as we said, that the future will lies on the content, yeah, the content of the internet, and whoever creates the content is very important. So promoting the trust-based uh, authentications, yeah, to get the people uh, that is the right people uh, to actually to. Uh, to, to, to provide the content is very important. So we are researching on the proof of authority, the consensus uh, uh, algorithm, yeah? consensus scheme that will allow only the authorized user yeah, to be the producer. Thus, uh, this will mitigate yeah, the attack of the future network, yeah? the attack of the user in the network. Uh, and uh, this trust framework will retrieve the user identity and check the trust uh, anchor, yeah, and then uh, we'll place a set of uh, the public keys that will uh, that have been uh, pre-authenticated before any validation can uh, process can begin. Yeah, so therefore, uh, this uh, scheme, yeah, will verify, yeah, the identity uh, using the information from other nodes in the network before allowing, yeah, the, the publisher to send the content, and this will hopefully uh, protect the content of the future uh, internet. Yeah? And this way, the framework can ensure the trustworthiness of information delivered to the future uh, internet environment. So in conclusion, yeah, very short, yeah? I'm, 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 I'm uh, 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 respecting the time yeah, given to me. <laughs> uh, the information-centric network is a very promising uh, future of the internet architecture. I myself have produced uh, uh, several PhD theses yeah? uh, uh, with in this area. Um, and this uh, has been uh, one of the important research area these days yeah? um, uh, in, the, uh, in, in, in the IETF and also in the IRTF. Yeah, Internet Research Task Force. Uh, but the flexibility of this architecture allows everyone to publish yeah, any content in such environment without restriction on the validity of the contents. You know, hence, uh, the untrusted content can possibly start in a network without control. And this uh, can probably cause the problem in the future. Yeah? So uh, in this uh, keynote talk, I briefly outline yeah, a framework yeah, of user authentication for the future internet architecture using a blockchain consensus-based algorithm yeah, uh, of proof of authority that promotes user integrity and reduces computational overhead by giving authority to the authorized user only so that they, they are uh, responsible. Yeah? They become responsible to uh, produce the content in the future uh, internet. So with that, uh, I thank you for your uh, attention. And again, yeah, 
um, I uh, welcome all the questions. Yeah? Uh, uh, you can address the question, uh, the uh, question to me, swahidi at uum.edu.my. Uh, I'm be more than happy. Yeah, My team will be more than happy to actually uh, answer uh, your concern and welcome any collaborations in this area. So with that, I thank you very much for the uh, attention. So, Assalamualaikum uh, warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Professor Suhaidi. I think that is such a powerful message you have, yeah? Technology itu uh, brings lots of benefits, but yet there's problems. Actually, uh, you address the authentic authentication problem, yeah? And uh, you propose a model for using a blockchain technology built in data signature and data persistence and create trust framework to promote trust-based authentication. This is very interesting, yeah? This is very interesting. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Suhaidi Hassan. Thank you. Okay, yes. Uh, and now we arrive to Q&A session. Uh, actually, we don't have any, any, any uh, participant who uh, asked some question yet, but I think I have my own question. I hope it's okay from, for uh, African speakers. Uh, the first question is uh, for Professor Ali. Uh, I believe that all models is suitable by assumption, right? So in which condition we are the model is mostly suitable uh, or it does, don't, doesn't even work in uh, uh, any uh, circumstances? Perhaps Professor Ali, can you answer the question? Professor Ali? Prof? Yes, 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 yes. What is the question? Yes, yes. I, okay. <laughs> Professor <laughs> Ali, it's okay, it's okay. I think uh, every model uh, has a basic assumption, right? Uh, how the model is suitable for one condition, but not in other conditions. So I, I'd like to ask you, in which condition will the model is mostly suitable or perhaps doesn't even work, right? The, in what condition? Optimistic and uh, uh, pessimistic condition. That makes the model is not working, for example. Thank you. Yeah, this model is uh, a model I developed firstly uh, based on the absorption of pollutant into porous material. And then the model, we try again. Uh, this is applicable for bioabsorption that means for accumulation of biomass in wastewater and so on eh? and then we try again this model is applicable for photocatalytic analytic uh, activity photocatalytic activity that is precipitation of pollutant into um, some material some uh, material activified by by light by everything so this apply uh, we can apply also and the less i try this model this applicable also for decoloration this mean for remove day from color from water we can apply that also by uh, facilitate by uh, fungi this, uh, in my opinion, this model is very strong. Uh, we can apply it for every case of uh, uh, of study. Yeah? Uh, this why uh, might be also this model we can apply for social science, for example, population growth, because we know that population growth because accumulation yeah from the year to year from year to year and then and so on but uh, we need to identify after that the parameter body parameter involved in this uh, model so this is why uh, i uh, confident to promote this model for you all uh, i think it's better if you have some uh, data uh, that uh, you have accumulation amount uh, over time. This model, I think, you can try to to use uh, to explain your uh, your 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 data. 
this one one k of uh, uh, justification is your data is good or not and so on and you can explain by this model this uh, this what, what is i hope for uh, the future and this model also already justified by uh, scientists around the world because i have published a lot of article uh, regarding using of this model and also this model also already adapted by many many scientists in the world because i know that because some of article myself will review uh, the article of them and the other article i know it's have been cited my article to uh, their article this why uh, i think is the model is uh, very promoting uh, promoting model uh, for analysis uh, the mass transfer for in the future i don't know is uh, i can respond your question or not because i i, I explain <laughs> <laughs> long enough for that no it's okay i think it's very clear so the point is your model is absolutely uh, strong and applicable yeah because it is already trying lots of research right yeah okay thank you very much professor i think it's clear enough and the second uh, question for dr bun lang uh you are trying to explain about the cost of the uh, urbanization but I'd like to know which is bigger, uh, do you think, the benefit or the cost of the urbanization? Dr. Bun Leng say? Dr. Bun Leng? Okay. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. I can hear you. So uh, <laughs> the question is like uh, you asked the benefit, the benefit of urbanization, right? Yeah, right. The benefit uh, okay. or the cost, what do you think? Which, uh, which one is bet, uh, bigger, actually? <laughs> like urbanization so uh, cause a problem like urban health problems uh, urban heat or uh, urban stroke or something like that so the benefits uh, like uh, improve uh, the economic growth you, you already know that uh, any any countries in the world and city in the world they get the benefit of urbanization so uh, to support the economic growth in each country in the world especially in the city size or uh, city citizens but then the economic growth is also cause a problem like uh, uh, damage. Uh, for example, actually, my research is not uh, uh, focused only in urban Ireland, but uh, we will extend it in the future to focus on the precipitation chain, good cause of urban flooding and damage economic development. Either. So, so the benefit is like, uh, as I said, it's economic growth for this country to support the uh, uh, microeconomic. Okay. Is respond to your answer? Yeah. Okay, and then uh, yeah. what do you think is the, the solution for the air heat uh, uh, the, that happens up here in your but country? Yeah, right, right? yeah. Yeah, actually, uh, this is uh, the problem, not only in Cambodia, but other countries, uh, no, other uh, uh, urban area, uh, urban city in other area. I think uh, the problem is like, the, the best solution is like to to contract or to build uh, urban space, a green space, and to reduce uh, 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 urban heat island, and also good planners, good planning leaders. So, you know, to reduce it, like uh, ventilation, is also decrease uh, urban heat island either. So, if uh, we have uh, a good planning, I mean a good urban planning, so we can reduce it. it there's like uh, water bodies and uh, like rivers, uh, we could uh, reduce a, a high building close to the river. So when, when the wind speed also come from the rivers can reduce it because a uh, uh, wind also brings some uh, humidity and reduce it heat island in the city. So that's why we need to think about uh, uh, planning carefully if we would like to reduce that because as you already know, some, some specific level of urban comforts can reduce for especially for the so when they increase high temperatures and then in, in city scale, so uh, uh, we, we need, we, we, we will use more energy. So the energy is also uh, release more heat than increased urban heat island. For example, like uh, aircon, we use a lot of aircon when they increase temperature in, in city scale. So uh, energy more consumption and release it by, uh, could say, uh, human heat. Yeah. So the best solution is, uh, I said, to increase the... Uh, 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 green space 
and by the spacing and also Gotling and build uh, uh, wind corridors. Uh, yes, wind corridor to reduce uh, heat islands in the city. Okay, scale. thank you very much for Dr. Burlingse for the explanation. Uh, and the third question of for Dr. Suhaidi Hassan. Dr. Suhaidi. Yes, yes. Yeah. Doctor, actually, uh, your model is very interesting. <laughs> I want to know, have this model applicated yet in Malaysia? Okay, uh, this is actually in the research phase, yeah? Uh, actually, oh, the future okay. internet. Uh, this, uh, we are actually implementing this model on the new internet architecture uh, called the name uh, data networking, yeah, the NDN. Yeah, so the name data networking as uh, uh, as many uh, what we call information centric, yeah, uh, is still in the uh, in the pipeline of the development, yeah, uh, which is uh, uh, by uh, is not yet uh, ratified by the Internet Engineering Task Force, but it is uh, also one of the uh, area where uh, the Internet Research Task Force, which is one of the uh, research uh, community, yeah, for the internet development. Is seriously looking into it, uh, but uh, I believe uh, this uh, uh, kind of things will be um, uh, applicable in the future. But portion of that definitely we have contributed, and it has become uh, some of the uh, what we call it uh, the document uh, standards yeah, of the uh, the ITU, yeah, the International Telecommunication Union uh, in two thousand eleven. Uh, 2016, yeah, we produced a document on the uh, internet catching, yeah, that uh, helps uh, in the uh, development, yeah, at the international level, and that has become one of uh, one part of the standard in the internet catching. Uh, definitely, uh, that is a portion of the uh, uh, the mechanism as a whole, yeah. But uh, uh, to uh, to have the full fledged mechanism. Uh, is not yet uh, available at the moment because uh, we do not fully deploy yeah the architecture yeah, uh, in the in the internet environment at the moment yeah it's it's like uh, uh, the, the the 5G maybe some uh, areas we are not yet deployed yeah uh, for the 5G yeah uh, in Malaysia we will be deploying 5G in 2022 yeah is uh, uh, 5G is the, the, the physical aspect of this uh, of the uh, internet uh, uh, infrastructure. So uh, we hope that uh, deploying the uh, what we call it the uh, more on the software aspect uh, will take some time. Yeah, toward the future. Okay, Doctor Sahidi, I hope the model will be successful not only for Malaysia but also for every country in the world. Yeah, I mean, I mean. I mean, well, I'm sorry for the inconvenience, but we have to end the session for today. And I'm going to read the closing remark. Uh, research is very powerful tools to find solutions during pandemic. By research, you can find solutions. For example, the research that create model for absorption, bioabsorption, decolorization, and also define problem from uh, what actually a positive program and technology like urbanization and internet. It also brings negative impact to the air heat and the trust issue from the internet. By doing research, we hope everyone can do more for the world and creating the world as, as a great place to live. Amin, ya Rabbal Alamin. Amin, amin. Okay. And of course, uh, as a huge appreciation for all the keynote speakers, we would like to award the certificate. And the first certificate is awarded to Professor Insinyur Muhammad Ali Fulazaki, CSDA certificate operator, please. Okay, uh, Professor... Ali Fulazaki is head of writing center from Jodha University in Indonesia. Thank you very much, Professor Ali Fulazaki. And then next certificate is goes to Dr. Bun Lang Say from Department of Geography and Land Management from Royal University of Phnom Penh, Cambodia. Thank you very much, Dr. Bun Lang. Okay, and then thank you, uh, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much. And then uh, our last speaker, Professor Dr. Suhaidi Hassan from Internet Work Research Laboratory, University of Malaysia. Dr. Suhaidi, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very, thank much, you very much for, for sharing. Uh, yeah. okay, thank you welcome. very much for inviting us here. Uh, yeah, you're welcome. And let's end our session with virtual photo session. Okay, Mr. Faisal, can you leave the screenshot, please? Everyone, please uh, on cam, put your sweetest smile and hold on. 
because we have lots of screen here. Okay, smile and uh, open your camera, please. Okay, is the is anyone already open the camera? Or the one hundred participant? Come on, open your camera. Okay, are you ready, Mr. Isa? Please or okay. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, one, two, three, and next slide. How many slides we have here? Four slides, Miss. Four slides, okay. Okay. One, two, three. Okay, and still please hold stay. on. <laughs> okay. One, two, three, and the last. One, two, three. Thank you. Alhamdulillah. Thank you for our kind of speaker who share all their thought and experience. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, all the board of committee for running the event so well. Don't forget to join the parallel session after the break, ladies and gentlemen. And hope so success. Hope everyone is fully really blessed, given a healthy and happy days ahead. And have a successful presentation in parallel session. We'll see you again at 1 p.m. Sebana kalau mau biar mereka cakap dua lagi lantas asal kira kawat tu bilai. Wabarakatuh ya kulhak wahai hadis sabil. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.